when you buy a grave. You don't ever buy it thinking that you're going to put your children in before you. Where does that come from? Where do you hide something like that in yourself? I've always said that I've never blamed it, and if I don't blame it, you know, why should anybody else? That's the way I look at it. I will never forgive John for doing what he did. Why did he do it? Why didn't he take me with him? Well, where we are today is Ballinkillen. I think it's about 300 odd people living in the community. It's a small village. It's got one shop, one primary school, the church and the community centre and the GAA pitch. And it's a very, very tight community, a very caring community. People support each other. It's a, it's a good place to be. It's a good, good place. I can see the church from, from the back of the house. I can see the graveyard from the back of the house. So yeah, everything is, is in, in eye distance. I went over to Saudi Arabia and I was there for about a year and a half when I met Sanj. I was attracted to him physically. He was tall, dark and handsome. Very easy going. And, um, and he was just... A nice guy. He was, uh, and, and in as much as a, I, I'm contradicting what he did, um, he was a good dad. He was a good dad. Um, and the boys absolutely adored him. Owen was uh, quite a sensitive wee boy. He was shy in his early years, but a good kid. Quite serious, but with a really dry sense of humour. He loved sport. He would try it all, but his passion was hurling. He had a great ability to calm maybe a, a child that was a little bit more unruly, you know, so he cared. He really, really cared. You know, my big brown-eyed boy. Rory came along when Owen was almost five. He was a fantastic little brother, much more confident from very early on. He was the, the little imp, the monkey, had a really, really cheeky, cheeky sense of humour. Just, just really bright and, and again, a happy, happy kid. I found out about 10 days beforehand uh, that Sanj had embezzled money from our local community. That was the first indicator that there was a problem. As it turns out, it was gambling, the stock market that he was involved in. I would have considered Sanj to be one of the most honest people that I'd have known. So for him to do something like this was completely out of character. I was in shock and trying to come to terms with it and trying to work out what we were going to do. So those 10 days were, were pretty, um, I suppose, tough between myself and, and him. I tried to keep that from the boys. I didn't want them to be, um, to be upset by it or to, to be aware of it, really. Owen knew that Sanj had done something wrong. Um, Sanj told him that. But, you know, we went to Duncanon the weekend before they died because that had been planned and I didn't want that to change and I really really wanted them to to still enjoy their summer so as far as I was concerned we kept things normal at the time he asked me you know, was I going to kick him out or were we going to separate and I remember saying that I didn't know I don't know where it would have ended ultimately he didn't give me the chance to to find out or to be there
brothers and that was it. And, and they all looked up to him as their big brother. He was never violent or anything like that. But then one day, he kind of gave me a shove up against the wall. Are you trying to poison me? And it was then I knew that the boy that was standing in front of me wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't mine, he wasn't right. And I know it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. I had to go to a court and get a bearing order. And I had to ask the judge to help me, for to get John help. He always knew that he was adopted. And then I got a phone call from the adoption agency, social workers in Dublin, saying that he had wrote him a letter saying that he wanted information and that he was entitled to it. And that if he didn't get it, he was going to do harm to himself. I asked her on the phone, I said, look, please, I said, whatever information John needs, I said, Please give it to him, I said, so he can close that book because it's in his life. He still ended up in limbo at the end of the day. If I knew at the time that John was as sick as what he was, I would have made sure he had his proper medication. And I wouldn't have left him with a responsibility of the boys on the day that I left the house. My father is from Ballycotton originally, and his father was from Ballycotton, and my mother was from Mogili, which is uh, about seven miles away. All my brothers and sisters are based in Ballycotton. It's a lovely, small seaside resort, which is lovely in the summer, a bit small but dreary like everywhere in the, in the winter. Everybody knows everybody in Ballycotton, yeah, which can be a good thing. I met John roughly six and a half years before we got married. John was tall, dark and handsome. He was quiet, but, uh, you know, we socialised every weekend, really, like, like any normal person would. He didn't seem to uh, portray any symptoms of depression at the time at all before we got married. So we got married in 2000 and um, six weeks afterwards, um, John had an accident in, in where he worked and he suffered with post-traumatic stress disorder. That accident did change an awful lot of things, you know. John stopped going out. He, he hurt his back as well. He wasn't able to drive. He was out of work for nearly two years. So our socialising stopped really six weeks after getting married. It was a very, um, it was very hard to deal with, you know. That was the first instance really of, of John suffering with a psychiatric illness. I, I don't believe that he ever recovered from that illness. So he was born on Friday the 13th of August 2004. There was a thunderstorm outside which was amazing for the middle of summer. John was very happy at the time, you know. She was a lovely child, she was bubbly, very sporty involved in gymnastics, judo. Um, she was in first class in school. Outgoing, very outgoing. Um, um, little girl, she was six since, you know, since the August, but um, I suppose at one stage, she had to make a choice between Irish dancing and gymnastics. So she came from gymnastics, straight to Irish dancing, and she was just jumpy and happy around the place, which was hilarious at the time, you know. Ella was born on the 2nd of July in 2008 and she was very mischievous. Whereas Zoe was, I suppose, quieter. Ella, she knew what she wanted and she was uh, mischievous, whereas she was always pulling Zoe's hair. So these are the memories that I have that you don't get from anything else, really, you know, that a child, the joy and that, that children bring you, you know, the innocence. I do believe that, you know, it is a gift having children, but um, yeah, beautiful two little girls. John minded Zoe and Ella two days a week and we had a child minder and who, who minded Zoe and Ella the other two days. John always said that he felt good when he was occupied, so when he, when he was minding Zoe and Ella he felt better and he was a good father. 
Family life was good. I was working four days a week. John was working maybe one or two days a week as a JCB driver for a local firm. But re recession had hit and um, I think he was worried about finances, about work, I suppose, um, you know, being the breadwinner for the family and, and worried about, I suppose, everything in general. And um, that's when his, I suppose, his, his depression came back. He had said to me earlier in the day that he would take the boys out in the afternoon and he was heading off into Carlo to go bowling. And he just gave me sort of an, an afternoon to myself. Said goodbye to the boys. It probably got to about half nine and I started wondering where he was. It wasn't that unusual, it was summer holidays. You know, I didn't really think too much of it. I tried phoning his phone but there was no reply and then I discovered that he'd actually left it upstairs. Another hour went past and I started getting anxious. I couldn't find the key to the second car so I had to phone my brother and we went into Carlo just to see was he in there somewhere because even still at that stage you're not you're not really thinking that there's anything wrong. There was no sign of him in Carlo came back home and I just kept hoping as we were driving up the road to the house that the car would be here. And it wasn't. So at that stage we came in and I phoned the guards. The rest of the night is somewhat of a blur. There were guards in and out and I had to get photographs of the boys and things like that. So there were people kind of coming and going a lot for that evening. I called various people then that I thought he might have gone to, um, including his brother up in the north. I also, in my head, thought that he might have just gone to the UK, over to his mum. So we phoned his mum at about seven o'clock in the morning and he wasn't. And that's when you started to kind of lose a little bit of hope. But at the same time, you know, it was like, he has to be somewhere. He's just hiding somewhere. Are the boys frightened? Are they wondering what's going on? They were reported missing at 1.30 a.m. this morning. Mr. Chadder left his home at 6.30 p.m. yesterday evening with his children. At the time, Mr. Chadder was driving a green Ford Focus. You know, it was getting worse. You were getting more and more scared. Honey, I wouldn't let myself. All day long, road signs along the major routes accompanied the search for the two boys and their father in the hope that drivers may help track the missing children. Then I went into the bank that morning to see if there was uh, any activity on the account. Then one of the detectives came and had to give a statement. And I was in the midst of that statement when my mobile rang. Um, it was a, a number I didn't recognise. So I picked it up and answered it and uh, it was Sanj. And um, he, uh, he just said, the boys are dead in the back. And um, so I kind of lost it at that stage. And I was like, no, no way, they couldn't be. So the detective took the phone at that point. And I remember screaming. And I remember sitting on the couch, just staring at the, the detective and going, please tell me my boys are okay. And I remember the seriousness of his face. Um, and I remember him saying, Kathleen, he, you know, he couldn't confirm at this point, he had to wait. I wanted somebody to say, that's not my boys. Um, and that they're, they're okay. Um, but it wasn't. This evening, that nationwide search was stood down. Gardaí were alerted to a single car collision outside the town of Westport in County Mayo this afternoon, where the two children were found dead. Their father's injuries are not believed to be life-threatening. Apparently, he was attempting to kill himself. It was a very, very uh, pathetic attempt, if that was the case. The scene was discovered less than 14 hours after Owen Rory and Sanjeev Chadha were reported missing. 
I afterwards discovered that, that the boys died somewhere around about five o'clock in the morning. So for all that we were doing throughout that day, it was too late. We had met uh, the men in Dungarvan. Was selling one of the old barrel top wagons. This was a small little miniature one. And the boys had seen us, all four of them, and they were mad about us. So we dealt for the wagon. Then we made the arrangements then to go down. We had to collect the wagon. So John got me with him, said to me, uh, I'll collect the boys for you, Mommy. He said to me, if you lay me the price of the diesel. So I said, if you're taking them in your own can, I said, make sure you put in the booster seats and stuff so and strap them in properly. So we went down to Waterford and anyway, we got the wagon, got a cup of tea and we were coming back along. And so we were just coming in through. Can Malik, when the phone rang, it was John. And he said, well, you know, it's just go to the prairie soon, so I think we should be home in about an hour. So everything all right, so the children all right. Yeah, Mummy, he said, everything is fine, he said to me. Here, he said to me, Paddy wants to talk to you. So I um, put Paddy on the phone, and he said to me, Mummy, did you get my wagon? And I said, yes, and said to him, I got it. I said, it'll be lovely now. Paddy said to me, I, I love you, Mummy. I said, I love you too, son. I said, be a good boy now, say for John, won't you? And he said, I will. Put me back on the phone to John, and I was talking to John for a few minutes. Again, as I said, no, no change in voice, no change in attitude, nothing. Only I'll see you when you come home, Mommy. He said to me, don't be in any hurry, take your time. But apparently, about 15 minutes after that phone call, something terribly went wrong with John. And I lost my three boys that year. A trampoline swings and a slide, all sad reminders of the twins who spent hours enjoying playing outside their house at Deer Park in Charleville. Thomas and Patrick O'Driscoll, described as lovable rogues, had just finished up in school when their older brother Jonathan collected them and brought them home in the afternoon but for some bizarre and unknown reason, murder them shortly afterwards. I think any mother's nightmare was to turn the corner and see crowds of people and yell at tape around my house. Before I knew it, it was a woman Gert talking to me. I just asked her to find my son, John. And I asked her not to hurt him because he didn't know it. He wouldn't have done this. She came back about an hour after. And she put her arms around me. And she said to me, I'm so sorry, Miss Sudders, because she said to me. A few hours later, the body of 21-year-old Jonathan O'Driscoll was found around 15 miles away in Butterfant. Gathy say he died by suicide. It was just like a nightmare that you thought you were going to wake up any minute and this wasn't going to be happening. What a nightmare that went on. I was supposed to go on until the day that we all passed away. Born in London, in Quickwood, and moved back to Wexford then in 1977, so 40 years ago. So I've been in Wexford ever since. I met Sharon, was actually in a nightclub in town. Started chatting and kind of went apart from then on. Sharon was very quiet, but once she got to know, she was a lovely person. We had a lot of fun times together, sitting down just talking or listening to music. We started uh, living together and family wasn't planned, but we got a nice little surprise then on 24th of 
September 2000, with Michaela come along. It was brilliant the way it worked out. You know, it sort of all fell into place. And then uh, Abby was born then in, on the 24th of September 2001. And then later on that year, the 20th of November, we got married. Michaela, she was very, very much like her mother. Very quiet. Showed even more than when uh, Abby came along, because she was like a second mother to her. You know, she was the big sister, but she was always cuddling her, making sure she was safe. And I mean, they were never apart, you know what I'm saying? Whereas Abby now, she was uh, a bit wild. She had no fear. Bobbly, like, full of love, full of fun, full of development. I've always said, and I always will, Sharon was a brilliant mother with the kids. She was great with the kids and always lively with them. You know, always, she'd, she'd be one of the kids half the time playing with them, you know, so no, there was never anything. I never t worried about the kids when they were with her or anything like that. Myself and Sharon had split up the previous year. Obviously, things weren't going right. We tried to make it work again and just didn't work out. And the last time I had the children, it was Patrick's Day, 2005. That was the last time I seen them. The two kids until two days before they died. I was trying to get in contact with family services and stuff like that to, you know, get so I could get access to the children and get regular visits and whatever. So I think that's what sort of caused a few of the problems then as well. You know, um, she might have thought I was trying to take the kids away or whatever. I'm not sure, but I mean that was never on the cards anyway. I just wanted to see the two kids, so. A few of us were all going to Cork for a poker tournament. And I was in the supermarket getting some stuff for the trip away on the Thursday. And I bumped into them. So I spent about 10 minutes in the supermarket with the two kids. And that was the last time I seen them, so. It was a Tuesday morning, the 16th of November, 2010. And the alarm went off and John nudged me anyway and he said, get up, it's half a seven. And I said, oh, rub my back there, you know, my back is aching. So he did rub my back. But he did seem a bit tense or nervous, but this wasn't unusual. I left home about 10 to 8, 8 o'clock for work. That morning, I was worried, and but I suppose there were many days that I was worried going to work, but I would always ring to see how things were and everything was okay. I always did that anyway, you know, every day, and had kind of like Zoe and Ella were always fighting for the phone, to answer the phone, so. But that morning, no one answered the phone. On my way to work, I rang John's sister, asked, would she mind, you know, ringing John saying, would you ever come down to keep him occupied for the day, knowing that he was a bit agitated. I was ringing the house phone, John's phone, and there was no answer, and John's sister came back, and she wasn't getting any answer either, so... An hour later, I decided I'd drive home to make sure everything was all right. Well, I was aware that there was a crash up the road, and the guard wouldn't tell me, you know, who was at in the crash or what the story was until my brother had met me and told me what had happened, that John had killed Zoe and Ella, and, Ella and he had crashed into a wall and killed himself. I think I just didn't believe. I didn't want to believe what I had heard. And driving past my own house, there was a guard standing outside and, and my brother said, do you want to ask him, do you want to go down? And um, he said, no, I wasn't allowed. But I think because I didn't see what had happened to Zoe and Ella, in my own mind, I couldn't believe what I had heard. And John had never been physically violent towards myself or Zoe or Ella. It was very difficult living with him when he was suffering with depression, but never had he physically harmed any of us at all, you know, ever.
I remember arranging the funeral, the guards being around, obviously because it was an investigation. And when Zoe and Ella was bodies came home, I just didn't want to touch Zoe or Ella because I knew that if I felt them, they would be cold, you know. It was horrific. It was, I think it was in denial for quite a long time as to what had happened. I couldn't believe that John would have done such a thing. Why did he do it? Why didn't he take me with him? Prior to the crash, the 43-year-old filled up a five-gallon drum with petrol at this petrol station, then crashed it into a wall just miles from his family home. It's today being revealed that John Butler was being treated for depression, but no one ever thought it could erupt in such a tragic way. I can't make sense of it. I've looked and searched for letters. Only 13 weeks before he killed Zoe and Ella and himself, he had been discharged from the mental health services. But he was still on the same dose of medication that he was with the past six months. I do believe that had I been involved in John's treatment in greater detail, they would have learned about his behaviours at home. I do believe that John went in and told the medical professionals what he wanted them to know and didn't give them a full story or a full picture of, of what his behaviours were at home, you know. down in Cork and I got a phone call I suppose when it was around midnight from Sharon's mother wanting to know if I'd heard from Sharon that day and uh, that her and the kids said that her and the kids were missing walking up and down the hotel room that night and I got a couple of calls during the night checking up and there was no word so in the morning um, I told my brother was early enough and uh he just said, um, Sharon's missing, like. And uh, he said, uh, I said, what? And he said, oh, we got a phone call and Sharon and the kids are missing, like. And I said, right, let's go, you know. So I said, give us 10 minutes, we'll just pack up quick and we'll just head back to Wexford. We came down, we were traveling back down from Cork and I was in contact with her mother the whole way down. And, uh, I just knew halfway down there that there was there was a problem. There was something major gone wrong. I, I just heard it in her voice. You know, we were all worried, but then we were saying, ah, she, she's a, you know, she's probably in her friends or somewhere, like, you know, don't be worrying or all or whatever. And um, 
I kind of really got a horrible sensation just when we got to the bridge in New Ross. Got back to Barntown, called into Sharon's mother's house, and she told me that the three of them were gone. Uh, that was that was a tough time. Um, like I just remember crying in on the road. And it was pouring down rain. I just seen Barry coming out with the front door. And uh, he ran out into the middle of the road. And he was screaming like, and I just uh, said, stop the car. Vinny come back, my brother, and picked me up. We went in, we had to tell my parents then. And said Sharon and Abby Michaela said they're, they're, they're dead. It's difficult to believe what was discovered here on the tranquil shores of Cat Strand in Wexford. 29 year old Sharon Grace, four year old Michaela, and three year old Abby were found together by local fishermen yesterday. Locals say the small community is devastated. remember very little about the funeral. But the one thing that I can remember was reporters open the trees taking photographs. That really annoyed me. It kind of made it like a circus, the way it was reported. And even the words murder, suicide, things like that. It's so hurtful when you're in that situation. You know, that there are proper words for it. You know, use them. Reading things like that, knowing what Sharon was like, and then she portrayed like that. That made it ten times worse. Still couldn't understand how it happened, because Sharon just wasn't like that. She'd never harmed the kids. She loved the kids so much. Maybe that's why she did do what she did, because she loved them so much, you know? So that's the only thing I can think of, really being honest. I had met with the funeral director already, who was a great support, and they put a lot of pressure on to get the boys released. They were released on the Wednesday, and he went straight over, brought them home, so they were back home together um, for those final nights, um, which was lovely, actually, in, in, uh, is the only way of describing it. Um, how do you describe, you know, a wake for your, your two children? But it was lovely um, for me because I got to spend those last couple of nights with them. Um, and that was important. It's important. The two hearses drove side by side as the young brothers were brought from their home in Ballinkillen to the local church. Their grief-stricken mother Kathleen walked between the hearses carrying her two sons, supported by her own family members, as did the boys' 14 cousins, singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star as they walked. I look at photos of, of my boys and, and go, how can anybody do something like that to two beautiful, beautiful boys that they profess to love. The 43-year-old was arrested and brought to Westport Guard Station where he was questioned until midnight last night. When he was pressed again as to why this had happened, Sanjeev Chada said, money, I ruined everything. Sanjeev Chad has spent his first night behind bars here in Castlery Prison last night. Where does that come from? Where do you hide something like that in yourself? 
This morning, Mr. Chadda's solicitor told the judge he had concerns for his client and asked that he be watched and psychiatrically assessed. However, when asked by the judge if this was for a fitness to plea, Mr. Hanley said it wasn't and withdrew the application. He didn't have any psychiatric history, he had no mental health issues. So where does it come from, you know? All he had to do was walk away, really. Actually, all he had to do was stay and face what he'd done. Sand wrote a number of letters after. One to the boys where he talked about the fact that he wanted to be there for them. He wanted to be around to teach them. Um, and as I saw, to teach them what? To teach them to lie, to cheat, to kill. It makes no sense and it will never, ever make any sense that he did what he did. You're dealing with the grief, you're dealing with the loss of Owen and Rory and, and that, but you're also dealing with, with the, the thought that you lay next to this person every night. The jury took just minutes to return a verdict of unlawful killing in relation to the deaths of Owen and Rory, whose father last month began serving a life sentence after pleading guilty to their murders. But we know that life doesn't mean life in this country, so he'll get out of jail at some point. There's a part of me that thinks that I'll end up bumping into him over the grave someday in the future. That bothers me, because he shouldn't. Please let him serve 
his life sentence. What I want to tell is when I go to the graves, it's like a piece of me is missing every time I do go. And it isn't easy to walk into a graveyard and look at a photograph of three strapping young boys. Probably have me talk to the girlfriends now if they were alive to know. These are things you're going to miss. My goal would be, I would like to explain to younger children that it's, it's not wrong for a small child to come up and say there's something wrong. I would like to get in there and try to be a part of this. I'd like to be a part of uh, suicide awareness in the schools and get the word out there more. That kind of takes a load off your heart knowing that you're after probably helping someone else. That some other child won't go through it. Some other parent won't go through it. 16th of April, obviously, um, the day they died, and the 24th of September. That's the, the two girls' birthdays. Uh, they're two really tough days. Every year, for those days, I go out for a walk out to Castron, have a chat to them. Our generation wouldn't have talked about things. Whereas if you catch people young and get them to talk, and get them to open up. You know, I think things like that should be mandatory in school. You know, that's where you want to catch it in secondary school, you know. Uh, educate, have a part of the curriculum. That you you talk about things like that. I try to run away from it, but you can't run away from it no matter where you go. And if someone asked me, are you sorry you ever met John? I would say no, because I wouldn't have had Zoe and Ella. And that was a gift, I believed, that I only had Zoe and Ella for a short while, unfortunately. But the joy that they brought I don't think I'll ever experience again, and I have those memories. I do believe they're with me. But it is very hard to get up every day and knowing what I had and the joy that Zoe and Ella brought me and to have they had their lives taken by their own father is horrendous. And I believe that it could have been prevented because of his mental illness, that is what killed my children. So that's why I'm campaigning for changes to the Mental Health Act for family and you know, spouses and partners to be involved um, in the treatment without breaking patient confidentiality. I do firmly believe that I will be reunited with them, that I will be with them at some point in the future and that they'll be waiting for me. This is just my life and I'm living it the best way I know how. There have been moments and, and I know I'm not suicidal. Um, I know I don't want to take my own life, but there are many, many times where I wish I wasn't here. And that's not to say that, you know, I need to go into a, a decline either. It's important. And that's the thing, re-engaging with life has to happen. Um, so.